attempting to discuss them entirely at that level. But I would argue that it is very important not to lose sight of or to downplay the sometimes grubby political aspects involved in both peacemaking and the practice of reconciliation. As with other political processes, there are winners and losers. It would be very foolish to label the losers who oppose either or both processes as evil because their interests led them to be spoilers or just critics. The subject of my presentation is comparing peace processes in deeply divided societies. I should say that I am interested in political comparisons, not just analytical ones. By political comparisons, I mean comparisons that influence behavior and are not simply done for scholarly or academic purposes. But let me start with the two other terms in my title of my presentation, peace processes and deeply divided societies. Precisely because they tend to be taken for granted, it is worth dwelling a little on their meaning and their use and abuse. First of all, it is worth saying that peace processes have their enemies insofar as they imply certain parameters about what might or might not be acceptable. Thus, to illustrate the point uh, from the most obvious case, Israelis opposed root and branch to a two-state solution in any shape or form are not irrational in opposing the peace process, since that is taken to imply the eventual outcome of two states. As, as in the light of recent speeches, you might also say that lukewarm endorsement for the two-state solution doesn't necessarily imply great uh, advance either necessarily. When the peace people, as they were called, appeared on the streets of Northern Ireland in 1976, demanding an end to paramilitary violence, they were met by Republican sympathizers with the slogan, Peace with Justice, and by the Paisleyites uh, with posters with the slogan, Victory Before Peace. The implication of these slogans was clear, that as far as Republicans were concerned, the injustices inflicted on the Catholic population justified the continuation of the armed struggle. While the Paisleyites were saying by implication that the British government bore responsibility for the campaign of random sectarian assassinations by loyalists because of its failure to crush the nationalist rebellion against British rule. <coughs> Precisely because these are not the positions likely to appeal to neutrals, we need to be careful in not underestimating how much support such positions are capable of securing in deeply divided society. To sum up this point as fairly as I can, some people oppose peace processes because of their association with outcomes they oppose. It would be unfair to say that these people oppose peace as such, but perhaps reasonable to say that they were only willing to settle for peace on their terms. And of course they would advance all manner of reasons why peace on their terms was not only morally justifiable, but a moral imperative. A favorite phrase in this context is the notion of a moral compass. Thus, it is said that the, the, the readiness of the British and Irish governments to permit, uh, never mind encourage, the inclusion in the government of Northern Ireland of parties linked to terrorist organisation shows that the two governments have lost their moral compass. Couching the objection thus enables the opposers to avoid addressing the awkward point that should fade political wing of the provisional Irish Republican Army now represents a majority of Catholics and not simply nationalists in Northern Ireland. And also that the more moderate Social Democratic and Labour Party would be unlikely to accept positions in government in Northern Ireland if Sinn Féin was excluded from office. Admittedly, circumstances matter, so, this, so it could not be ruled out altogether that uh, there might come a day when the SDLP might go into government without Sinn Féin. <coughs> However, by couching the objection in terms of fundamental moral principle, the objectors avoid having to grapple with such details and its moral relativizing implications. However, there is a much larger group of people for whom the term peace process has come to embody some negative association. 
use of the term peace process is generally not a very good sign. South Africa did not have a peace process, it, it had a transition. Eastern Europe went through a transition from communist rule to liberal democracy, peacefully for the most part, but with the dreadful exception of what happened in the Balkans. Latin America had a transition from military rule to liberal democracy, but we emerging democracy as it was often labeled. The use of the term peace process hints at peace as an aspiration and not necessarily an achievement. And here I'm not referring to the common objection that the absence of violence is an indication of at least only a negative peace, and that the requirement of peace is more onerous than simply bringing an end to overt acts of violence. The sad truth today is that the existence of a peace process is consistent not merely with some political violence, but with full-scale war. The worst offender in this respect is the Middle East peace process, or to put it more narrowly, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, which has gone alongside uh, quite uh, obvious wars. The use of the term peace process goes back a long way in this context. It's worth emphasizing that it predates the Oslo process of 1993. And let me give couple of examples of this usage. Meren Ben Venisti has a chapter in a volume called The Elusive Search for Peace, edited by Herman Hiliomi Yanni Gagliano, uh, which is entitled The Peace Process and Intercommunal Strife. Notice the the uh, at the end of this. Well, one section of Ben Venisti's chapter has such resonance that I frequently quote it and will do so again. Ben Venisti says the following. The, pro prota the protagonists consider conflict resolution devices only through the prisms of their respective gains and losses, not as a means to resolve their differences amicably. So there's ways in which people can look on a peace process as a way of advancing their cause, not for pursuing peace at all. My second example is more recent. It comes from a speech from a by the American Secretary of State, James Baker, in 1989, but quoted recently, just on the eve of, uh, of Obama's, uh, of Obama's uh, speech in Cairo, it's quoted in the International Herald Tribune. And basically, what James Baker says is that uh, the Palestinians, uh, that rather than the Arab states, who should uh, improve their relations with Israel, not just as part of the peace process, as a catalyst to, to uh, a wider peace. Um, so far as the, the United States was concerned, there was a peace process even before the first Gulf War, in other words. This is a clue as to what peace processes involved that has been absent from a number of transitions, and this is external mediation. Of course, external mediation comes in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, you can simply have what might be called the provision of good offices, but you can also have uh, external mediation in the form of coercive diplomacy at its most imposing, such as the Dayton Agreement on Bosnia. And this brings me conveniently to the, to the next term, deeply divided societies. The argument being that deeply divided societies are incapable of resolving their differences without a large amount of external assistance to do so, and that justifies uh, the extent of coercive diplomacy that may be involved. There is a surprising amount of confusion as to what constitutes a deeply divided society. For example, Tim Sisk, in his book on the South African transition, defines a concept in terms of two criteria, clear lines of segmentation and a high degree of social inequality. Neither of these seem to me to be relevant criteria. <coughs> the segments in Switzerland are clearly enough defined, but Switzerland doesn't feature in any list I've seen of a deeply divided society. Somewhat similarly, Brazil stands out as one of the most unequal societies in the world in terms of the distribution of income and wealth. But Brazil is not, on most people's reckoning, a deeply divided society. By contrast, Northern Ireland, which is given the dubious accolade by Donald Horowitz that it is not just a deeply divided society, but practically in a class of its own as a severely divided society, 
is not a society characterized by massive inequalities. Let me suggest two alternatives in an interrelated criteria for the United societies. They are societies in which there is a conflict of legitimacy over the existing political system, polity, and this conflict runs along communal lines. And the second criteria follows from the first. These are societies with a high propensity for political violence, particularly for what a colleague of mine uh, many years ago called representative violence. And I'll just quote what he has to say on the subject of representative violence. <coughs> this condition of representative violence is very simple. If any one of a great number of people can be punished for something done by the community they come from, and if the communities are sufficiently clearly defined, there is a risk that, that anyone attacking a member of the other community can set in motion an endless chain of violence. Even a few aspects of the representative, of the representative violence enjoy widespread support, of the kind that could be established by opinion polls, it is only necessary for people to understand what is happening for it to create a generalized danger. Everyone might be a target for reprisal for something done in their name and without their approval. So the sense of tit for tat violence in these commonly divided societies and the fear it creates and the sense that you, when you encounter a deeply divided society, that you're encountering a force field. That, that I think is what sets deeply divided societies apart from other sorts of societies. Um, yeah. Frank Wright was very conscious of the scar such societies bore from past intercommunal conflicts. And it made him cautious about describing such societies as at peace during periods when there was no political violence. He described such periods as ones of tranquility rather than peace, insofar as the threat of a renewal of intercommunal violence did not disappear altogether. Frank's skepticism should be distinguished from an attitude quite prevalent in deeply divided societies, and this is that peace is a kind of metropolitan illusion akin to the biblical tale of the lion lying down with the lamb. To groups particularly who conceive of themselves as under siege, the barbarians are always at the gates, and only eternal vigilance can safeguard their community from being overwhelmed. But sometimes presenting their own case as unique, groups in such situations do tend to identify with others whom they see as occupying a similar position to their own. Hence we get cases of unionist politicians from Northern Ireland who have gone to considerable lengths to associate themselves with the cause of the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus, Northern Cyprus, to take one example. Two unions politicians bought houses in Northern Cyprus and continually express their support for its case in the European Parliament, and have done so in the past. In the context of peace processes, this identification with other deeply divided societies has, on the whole, exercised a positive influence on the political. An important procedural aspect of the negotiations that led up to the Good Friday Agreement of the 10th of April 1998 in Northern Ireland was, quote unquote, the principle of sufficient consensus. This was quite carefully defined in the negotiations as meaning that for any proposal to be adopted required the consent of, the, of a majority of representatives of the two main blocks in the talks, the Unionists and the National. At this point in time, the Social Democratic and Labour Party constituted a majority of nationalist representatives. The situation was more difficult and more complicated in the case of the Unionists. The largest grouping amongst the Unionists was David Trimble's Ulster Unionist Party. But the party did not command a majority of Unionist representatives. The consequence was that the support was needed of at least one of the Unionist parties connected to parliamentary organisations i.e. terrorist wings, if you wish to put it that way. At this juncture, both the Democratic Unionist Party and the United Kingdom Unionist Party had left the talks in protest and Sinn Féin's inclusion. 
So they couldn't be counted on the yes side. So Trimble had to get the support of one of the political parties that was linked to a terrorist organization for any kind of agreement to be adopted. Now all of this really did matter. For a time, one of the paramilitary loyalist parties was actually excluded from the talks for a limited period as punishment for actions by its terrorist wing. Um, the terrorist wing had broken its ceasefire, so the party linked to it was excluded. Uh, and in their annoyance, the two loyalist parties then threatened to pull out of the talks altogether, in which case there would have been no agreement. And there was a very dramatic moment in the proceedings in 1998 when the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Mark Bolland, actually went into the prison in Northern Ireland, the main prison of holding uh, people who had committed very serious offences, and she sort of was rubbing shoulders with some of the most notorious murderers in our society, trying to persuade them, please stick with this peace process. An interesting issue, actually, is whether uh, if there had been a male Secretary of State, it would have been possible for a male Secretary of State to have gone into the prison and done that. But a woman could do that without compromising her position as being seen as against violence. It's very interesting that it was, it was fortuitous that we had a woman Secretary of State at that point in time, because I really don't think that if we'd had a man, it, that would have happened. And it actually saved the talks. The talks were done and we got our agreement. Now, where did the principle of sufficient consensus come from? Well, actually, the principle of sufficient consensus came from the South African negotiations. It was borrowed from the South African negotiations. Or to be strictly accurate, it was borrowed, uh, the term was borrowed from the South African negotiations. Uh, the term had existed in Northern Ireland, it had been given a different label, it had been called parallel consent. But deliberately, they used the term that was used in the South African negotiations, the principle of sufficient because it was associated with a successful peace process. And the British and Irish governments wanted the reputation of a successful peace process to adhere to the Northern Ireland talks. And the fact that the South African situation had residents from the Northern Ireland political bodies, they identified the South African situation as in some respects similar to Northern Ireland's. They saw that there was a connection. They didn't regard what had happened in South Africa as irrelevant to what might happen Northern Ireland. It was an inspiration to the Northern Ireland process. So we had imported into the Northern Ireland process this term, the principle of sufficient consensus, which was then carefully defined in, in, the, in the procedures for the talks in Northern Ireland and really did actually matter, as I've explained. Now, ironically, in the South African talks, the principle of sufficient consensus wasn't very clearly defined. What it actually meant in the South African process was, was basically that if the national party in the ANC agreed and we think that was more or less it. But, uh, but, 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 but nevertheless it is interesting. Okay, done. So that shows you that the, how the South African process influenced the Northern Ireland process. Now it has to be said that the Northern Ireland process has itself gone on to have an influence on other processes. It had an influence on a short-lived peace process that occurred in the Basque country in 1988 to 1999. Uh, the, the nationalists in Basque actually called their discussions the Irish Forum. And then at that point, ETA had a ceasefire in 1998, and there was a start of what seemed like a Basque peace process uh, based on the example of the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Uh, no, it went absolutely nowhere, it has to be said. The reason it went nowhere was that the Spanish central government, Madrid, didn't have the same interest in a Basque peace process as the nationalist parties had. And also because uh, the political wing of ETA was much weaker than the political wing of the provisional IRA. So there were factors as to why the, peace, the Basque peace process didn't work. But nevertheless, they tried to build a Basque peace process on the back of the Northern Ireland peace process. Another example which is quite interesting, also quite contentious, people might have different views on it here, is the attempt by the Indians particularly to use the, the example of the Northern Ireland peace process in the context of the peace process with Pakistan, particularly in relation to Kashmir. Uh, 
of the huge attraction of the peace process in Northern Ireland to the Indians is that you may have noticed that one consequence of the Northern Ireland peace process is that the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland hasn't changed. The border remains exactly where it is. And I think a peace process that led to uh, the ratification of the line of control as a, a sort of final border in relation to Kashmir would be very welcome to the Indian government. So you can see the attraction of the Northern Ireland case as far as the Indians are concerned. And their belief that uh, dealing with they, what they look at in the Northern Ireland case is the further the fragility of peace process, processes means that the existence of a favorable environment is vital to their prospects for survival. Secondly, the achievement of peace requires more than a calculation of the balance of political forces at the time and its embodiment in a political settlement. Settlements that simply reflect balance of force or balances of power rarely endure for the simple reason that over time there are inevitably shifts in the relative weight of the political forces that make up the polity. The legitimization of a new political dispensation is dependent on its having normative dimensions that can be defended in terms of current best practice internationally. This is all why, why international norms also have such an role to play in, in, in peace processes. Thirdly, even the most successful peace processes encounter difficulties and obstacles along the way. This provides a valuable lesson to those in the midst of a peace process that the difficulties they encounter have been overcome in other situations and that ultimate success is possible. So precisely because peace processes tend to be long drawn out affairs and even transitions can be quite long and difficult, the fact that there are other examples of other deeply divided societies that have been through this difficult transition, been through a difficult process, and have got to the other side is important to people in the midst of a peace process, ultimately that it can be successful. Now I said before that I've got a tiny bit more cynical about peace processes. And this is because I think the term peace process has tended to become a little bit devalued uh, through association with cases such as the Israeli-Palestinian one, where almost the concept of a peace process, of, of, of an enduring peace process, has become almost a substitute for anything else. That it's, you know, all that matters is the survival of the process. The process simply continues regardless of setbacks. So no number of wars, no number of setbacks. People still talk about uh, reviving the peace process, putting the peace process back up on track. It's like it's sort of something that can't ever be destroyed. It's always there and it can continue. And it's become, the existence of a peace process, however improbable, has become a kind of substitute for uh, anything uh, more uh, enduring. Uh, so I have to become a little bit cynical in the way that people to use the term peace process as a way of sort of describing a situation more or less total on pass, uh, uh, you know, and say, but there's still the peace process when everybody really knows that the situation is completely deadlocked with actually, actually little, little hope of any progress. Now, I, I want to, to conclude by, by drawing a distinction between settlements largely the product of internal dynamics and those that are the product of external uh, mediation. The point that I was going to make was that really in terms of in terms of the difference, South Africa is 
one looks at political settlements that had occurred prior to the South African War, you can look at cases where actually reconciliation was based precisely on the determination to draw a veil over the past. And I'll give you two examples. One was the transition to democracy in Spain, where there was this determination after the transition from Franco not to dwell on the past, not to revisit the civil war. <coughs> People now in Spain are saying it's safe for them to do so at last, but in the immediate aftermath of the transition to democracy, there was a determination in Spain not to visit the territory of what had happened in previous conflicts. It was assumed that that was too dangerous, and so the veil was drawn over the past. And the other rather interesting case, although now we'll be seen in a rather different light, but we forget there was a decade of success in terms of racial reconciliation, and that is the case in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, for the first 10 years after independence in 1980, uh, you had a racial reconciliation in Zimbabwe. There's a famous article in International Affairs by Jeffrey Herbst called Racial Reconciliation in Zimbabwe. 